The city of Prince George has come a long way since its creation. More than 70,000 people call the city home and have contributed to its rapid growth in just over 100 short years. A lot has happened since then, and as we continue to grow, we'll take a look back at the pieces of history behind each neighborhood and the people who have built this place we call home. It started here at the confluence of the Fraser and Nechaco rivers, a village belonging to the Clayton Tenay, which translates to the people where the two rivers flow together. Archaeological evidence shows the Clayton people lived on the land for about 9,000 years. They traveled each season to hunt, fish, and pick berries. It was a tight-knit community. Stories from that time have been passed down through word of mouth for generations. Before the arrival of the white people, we were one nation and we were big. We spoke the same language, you know, and our nation went probably like way past uh, the Rocky Mountains because the Grease Trail went, went that far. Eh? In the early 1800s, Simon Fraser established Fort George as a temporary canoe outpost. That's when life started to change for the Clayton Tenay. The Fort George Indian Band Reserve was established just before the turn of the century. That's located where downtown Prince George is now. That was the last time there was a good sense of community at that time, yes. Because everybody did everything together, eh? like hunting. Uh, there was about, my dad told me stories about like there was like 50 dugout canoes that would go up to uh, McGregor area and they would harvest meat and they'd fill up the whole 50 canoes and they'd come back to the village with the, with the meat. And when the villagers saw them come around the corner, they'd welcome them with drums. And that sense of community would never be the same after the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway came to the region in the early 1900s. When news of a railway caught wind, surveyors were quick to establish communities near the Clayton Tenay Reserve. Central and South Fort George were formed and both wanted Grand Trunk Pacific in their backyard. In 1906, uh, A.G. Hamilton created South Fort George, so just south of Fort George. Uh, he preempted a large parcel of land and then started selling lots. Uh, gambling and drinking were legal, so bars started popping up, brothels started popping up, um, and people did start moving there. It was really important for paddle wheelers. Uh, it provided an outpost for the paddle wheelers to stop when they were coming up the Fraser River from Soda Creek. And then it was an outpost for the Grand Trunk Pacific to ship supplies to while they were building the railway. South Fort George was a rough and tumble place. Similar to a work camp, the majority of residents were men. In the early years of Prince George, there wasn't a lot to do that wasn't going to get you in trouble. Uh, in South Fort George, bars were popular. There was the odd brothel and there was a lot of drinking and gambling. It really was a work town. Meanwhile, Central Fort George was established roughly where Spruce Land Mall is today by George Hammond. That community was marketed as a place to raise a family. Drinking and gambling were less prevalent, and because of that, schools and hospitals were built. But the great unanswered question in the early 1900s was, which town site is better suited for a railway? Well, according to Clayton Leitonay stories, the Grand Trunk Pacific originally had plans for the railway to run through Giscombe, 
but it set its sights on the confluence of the rivers instead and purchased 1,366 acres of land for its own community from the Clayton Tanay people. Grand Trunk, they changed their mind. Eh? They decided that Giscom is not the place for the central British Columbia city, and they chose Fort George. Eh? And that's when our people, they got burned out. Not everyone in the band was accepting of that sale, though, and in September of 1913, in an effort to scare the Clayton people out of the reserve, a number of buildings were burnt and they were forced to leave, moving to several other reserves around the area. You know what, I really, I really think that's when the division concept came in, you know, and the mistrust came in. And because uh, that railway coming through really messed, messed everything up for us, eh? our community, our, our relationship with one another. It just kind of went, we all kind of went our own ways right, within our community. Eh? There was no community gatherings like what we used to have. It's a dark time in the history of our community and it's something local government is still trying to reconcile more than 100 years later. At the same time as the Central and South Fort George competition, a separate dispute was going on between Grand Trunk Pacific and the BC Express Company or the BX Express. Charles Miller was the owner of that company and he showed up to the negotiating table with a letter of ownership from the Clayton Tanay to take over their land. He also wanted a piece of that precious land that was promised to bring economic success along with it. The Grand Trunk Pacific lost its mind over this. Um, they went to Ottawa and claimed and, and, and complained about this and stated that the Aboriginal community didn't have the right to sell the reserve to anyone, which was literally true. It had to go through the federal government because the land was held for the Clayton Tanay through the federal government. However, the BX company folks had a piece of paper that said they owned it. It was a long, drawn-out process, and finally the federal government determined Grand Trunk Pacific had to let go of some of that prime real estate. Which is this sort of elongated stretch of homes and, and, uh, and small businesses that kind of rings the other side of, of Connaught Hill. And so that was the accommodation in the aftermath of the litigation because indeed it had been found that the Miller uh, that the Miller bunch the BX company uh, crew had in fact legal title to this land and so it needed to be uh, extinguished in some fashion and so the Miller edition was born and it represented about a quarter of the total town site to this day some of the oldest homes in Prince George are located in the area the original plan was to name each street after plants and trees indigenous to the area, though that didn't exactly happen. It took about two years to clear what was left of the Clayton Reserve. By 1914, streets, boulevards and parks began to appear in Fort George. The American architectural firm Brett Hall & Company was commissioned to design the new town and went with a look that was extremely popular in the States at the turn of the century. They went with the City Beautiful plan, which usually has those semicircular streets, beautiful parks and lots of greenery, so that's still prevalent in Prince George with the Crescents, and that's why we have those semicircular streets and uh, Duchess Park in the middle. The Crescents were meant to be a prestigious neighborhood, with four streets that curve with the natural topography to frame Duchess Park. The people who bought that land were those who had money. Developers wanted to get away from the traditional gridlock of streets, so angled roads, plenty of green space and traffic circles were built. There was a boom in construction at this time with 30 projects underway. George Street was the business center and there were hotels, a community hall and the Princess Theatre on the way. By the end of 1914, it really started to look like the city. In fact, incorporation was right around the corner, but the First World War got there first. The year was 1914 and our little community was seeing rapid growth. The First World War broke out in the summer of 1914 and it seriously slowed down the progress being made on what was then Central, South and the Grand Trunk Pacific's Fort George. To say that 
northern British Columbia almost empties of white settlers is not an exaggeration. Um, so we can estimate that the Georges, Central Fort George, what becomes Prince George, and South Fort George probably had about 5,000 settlers, give or take. We probably had around 150 indigenous peoples. Uh, by 1921, the population here is only 2,100. So it more than halves. Um, and people leave in part to go enlist in the war, obviously enough, but sort of the, the bloom is off the rose at the end of the war. Uh, it's hard to overstate how significant the war is changing the way that people in the Western world view life. Um, and as such, there's not sort of the unbridled enthusiasm for striking out for the edges and taking up these wonderful challenges of building new communities. And the simple fact is, is that beginning in the 1920s, Prince George is really um, kind of stuck. For the better part of the next 25 to 30 years, there's a slow accretion of population, but nothing spectacular. There was a lot of hope that timber would be a great resource during the war, but the railway at the time wasn't very effective at moving it to the markets that needed it. So nothing really changed in the community during this time except for one little thing, its name. To separate itself from Central and South Fort George, Grand Trunk named the town site Prince George, and in 1915, residents voted during the first ever municipal election. The votes were 153 to 13 in favor of changing the name. The city stayed about the same size for years. City boundaries didn't expand and the population stayed steady around 2,000 people for about 20 years until World War II. By that time it has a railway, a railway that's pretty solid and established. There are a lot of sawmills around and there is tremendous demand for uh, wood to build the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, aerodromes, classrooms and buildings that are needed in order to operate that particular plan to help win the war. So Prince George benefits directly from all of the employment that provides by the, that particular work, as well as the deployment of an entire division with headquarters and training facilities in Prince George from 1942 to the end of the war with a lot of very uh, well-built, semi-permanent facilities constructed in the area, many of which still exist. And we've got uh, a real economic boom happening locally because of the presence of the military. The old Civic Centre, which was wheeled down 15th Avenue, it's one of the reasons 15th Avenue has four lanes and a nice wide boulevard. It's, it's not because of long, foresighted uh, urban planning, it's because they needed a wide area to move this new civic center, which was a former armories, all the way downtown to its where it was uh, by the swimming pool for many, many years until the new civic center was constructed. The arrival of the military in Prince George nearly doubled the population. Headquarters were set up near the Nechaco River just outside of city limits. There was housing for soldiers and a staging area around the area of the CN Center. There were a few thousand citizens living here, and then all of a sudden you get to eight to 12,000 soldiers at various times landing in Prince George. A lot of them were what we call zombies. Uh, they were conscripts who were put here to do domestic uh, defense rather than to be used for invasion purposes. And this, there were mutinies and, and problems with that when there was a, a call to move some of these troops to Europe. They didn't want to go. They're, they were considered themselves the old term fencibles, okay for home defense, but not okay for being deployed uh, to fight wars in other places. Yeah. So th there were a lot of troops here. And when that war wrapped up, many chose to stay and others returned home to start families. The Veterans Land Act area uh, was, was land put aside for veterans to live in, uh, to give them a home. They, there were all sorts of uh, important benefits that were allocated to, to uh, veterans after the Second World War uh, in terms of training and educational opportunities. I mean, you could be a, a typhoon pilot and then be trained to a, as a dentist like Denning Waller was. Uh, you, could, you could get all kinds of great education and you could get uh, land, a land grant to build a house uh, very inexpensively and they would put you in there and, and this became what is called the, the VLA. Uh, it's, it's an area now that's an older neighborhood and it's changed quite a bit, but that was a key part of the expansion of Prince George. 
A few decades later, the VLA subdivision changed slightly to honor Prince George veterans who died in the Second World War. Names like Porter, McAuliffe, and Milburn, which are still there today. But it wasn't just the VLA that was bursting at the seams after the war, it was the entire community. At the end of the war, the city was so hard up for housing that the city took over the uh, old H, what we call the H huts. The huts were all built in an H shape with two wings and a central core for services. And there was basically no housing around, very little housing. So uh, there were problems with that from right through to about 1949, 48 or 49, that, that was occupied by people just moving in and making the best they could out of a home site. In the 1950s, the city was booming. Technology was advancing and sawmills were employing more people than ever. After much controversy, the Pacific Great Eastern Railway was finally complete and connected the region to the Lower Mainland. That railway had been in the works since the early days of Fort George, though it kept running into delays and roadblocks. Many joked PGE standed for Prince George eventually. Once that was finished, it started a whole new round of development. The first ever subdivision was started in the early 1950s. Around the same time, the city expanded its borders for the first time, doubling the land owned by the city. The Nichaco subdivision was an extremely attractive place for residents and was located around the same area George Hammond set up Central Fort George in 1909 and where the military had set up headquarters during World War II. Central Mortgage and Housing was interested in developing neighborhoods and housing areas that took more advantage of the landscape. For example, in that subdivision, there's a big ridge going through there. So there's an upper part and a lower part. And some of the houses are built along the edge and you can overlook the park down in the, in the uh, subdivision. So Southern Mortgage and Housing was responsible for laying out the streets and actually merchandising the lots. And the city was in partnership with them at the time, that was 58. The city was in partnership and supplied underground services, water and so on, as an extension from what was being planned beyond Kearney Street. In my view, it has such heritage value. And it filled up within a year. The lots were all sold, I'm sure, the first few months. Everybody was grabbing a lot because there was no building space. Not long after, the city started developing the Seymour subdivision. Much like the Nechaco area, it was designed to follow the natural topography of the land. They had the same kind of street pattern. They did not follow the grid pattern because in the Seymour subdivision, in behind those, uh, the restaurants and apartments along Central Street, in behind there's a steep bank and a ravine and so on. And so the land was not unlike what we had in, in the Chaco. They had, a, they had a, a hillside going through it. And you don't put a grid plan on a hillside like that. There were so many people living in Prince George at the time that there was a major school crisis. There weren't enough teachers to teach the kids and not enough room. Civic facilities were being built and maintained by city council, like the Prince George Public Library and the Coliseum. Wooden sidewalks were replaced by pavement, modernizing the city. Fort George and Connaught Hill Parks opened. Construction began on the new Prince George and District Hospital, which would later be renamed to the Prince George Regional Hospital in 1960. Prince George was starting to take shape and, in many ways, it still looks similar today. In just a few short years, though, the city is about to boom once again. Since the early days of Prince George, the forestry industry was a major driver to the economic success of the community. In the 50s and 60s, there were about 500 small sawmills in the area and those mill workers brought their families along for the ride. 
The population doubled after the Second World War and the city was bursting at the seams. So it expanded its borders in 1953. Just a few short years later, in 1958, the city expanded again. There was word there would be a new player in the forestry scene, pulp. And three pulp mills were in the works. So the city's borders then encompassed nearly the entire bowl. Expansion went west and south beyond the bypass highway, which is now known as Central Street. This subdivision, the Quinson subdivision that we're in here, was built in really started around 1962 because the first phase of Quinson School was 1962. And the, I was the architect for the Quinson School and the school board decided to build six classrooms on 2nd and Ogilvy and between Ogilvy and Patterson. So before those six classrooms were built, they needed two more, so the contract was expanded to add two more classrooms that same year, 62. And by 63, they were bringing in portable school rooms mm -hmm. because the Quincy area was expanding so much. New shops, houses, new schools, apartments. And several of us had bought lots. We bought the lot in privately in 66, I guess it was, that someone wanted to sell it. They were decided they were going to move somewhere else. So we bought the lot, but we held it for four years because we had a house down on uh, Douglas Street in the, uh, in the Chaco subdivision down there. So, and my first house was 800 square feet. My next house was 1,300 square feet down in the Chaco. I moved up to Dizelle and I built 1,800 square feet. Crazy. <laughs> the population in Prince George doubled once again in the early 60s from about 5,000 people to more than 10,000. There was a record number of kids in the school district at 2,100. There were so many kids, they had to attend in shifts. One thing about the uh, WAC Bennett government, Bennett was interested in expanding the north. Mm -hmm. And when there was such a demand for schools between 62 and 65, there was practically no interference or objection from the department in Victoria. Just get the schools built. And that's why there were so many nice gymnasia around now in some of the elementary schools, because money wasn't a problem. They just said, get it built. It was such a rush. Because in the early 60s, the pulp mills were coming in here, oil refinery built and, and so on. The first pulp mill was complete in 1964, Prince George Pulp and Paper. And just two years later, Northwood and Intercontinental opened their doors. The Spruce Land, Lakewood, Perry and Highland subdivisions were built to house all of those newcomers to town. A lot of times there was an attitude whether or not uh, you, like the people that were coming to town, they thought that they're going to take over. Mm -hmm. So until they realized that people from Prince George were pretty stubborn and they would welcome them. But a lot of times when the, the workers came to work at the pulp mills and stuff like that, because they come from other centers, they thought they were going to change Prince George, but it didn't happen. They fell in love with it and enjoyed it. The attitude in Prince George has never really changed. We've always been a small town attitude. We, we welcome everybody, we're not clicky, we're not this, we're not that. But growing up as a kid, it was just a great place to grow up. Lots of things. I can remember you go back to in Lower College Heights and we used to go camping out there and picking berries and we'd come out north to do the blueberry picking and stuff like that with mom and dad. It was a time that holds fond memories for many that grew up in Prince George. For me, I remember going to elementary school at King George V, which is, uh, was located on the uh, site of the, uh, of, uh, the near, well, near the site of the former Baron Bing High School and uh, on the other side of the park, that's, that's Duchess Park where the, that school now is, is where King George V was. 
uh, it was a, a great place to live. I remember going through streets with high snow drifts uh, that weren't, weren't able to be cleared because there was just so much snow and compact neighborhoods where everybody knew everyone. Uh, people didn't worry too much about crime uh, and uh, there was always lots to do whether it was cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, or other outdoor activities in the winter or summer. Fishing, hunting, boating, it's always been something here. The city expanded its borders again five more times in the 60s. The population in 66 was nearly 25,000 residents. While all of this new growth was happening, some old areas were also seeing big changes. South Fort George was still its own town site and it gained municipal status in 1968, though that was short-lived as that community amalgamated with Prince George just a few years later. And those living on Cottonwood Island, commonly known as the Island Cache, were running into trouble. The area was plagued by flooding. In June of 1964, homes in the low-lying areas had water up to the windowsills. Half of the 900 people living there were evacuated. People had been living on the island cash since the early days of Fort George. It was close to sawmills and planer mills and had always been an inexpensive place to live. In the 50s and 60s, the main residents of the area were new immigrants to Canada and Indigenous peoples. It was an area that had a strong community feeling and many rallied to save it. The area was eventually shut down by the city as many homes were deemed unsafe. The majority of those people were essentially transplanted to the VLA. In the late 60s, the College of New Caledonia opened, which attracted even more new residents to the city. Prince George at this time was not only attracting those mill worker types, but working professionals. Another major milestone was also right around the corner. And that was the city's largest expansion and amalgamation with the South Fort George, the Hart, College Heights and Pineview areas of town. On November 2, 1974, Prince George and area residents headed to the polls to decide whether or not to expand the city's borders. Many rural folks believed this would increase their taxes and they weren't sold on the idea. In fact, the majority of rural residents voted no. But it all came down to the residents living inside the city at the time. Taking over the area north of town would allow the city to collect property taxes from the pulp mills, and it was promised that much of the surrounding area that was struggling with infrastructure problems would be fixed up. About 30% of the area population showed up to vote, and of the roughly 7,000 people, 55% voted to amalgamate. By 1981, Prince George was the largest city outside of the Lower Mainland in the province with a population of nearly 68,000 people. While those areas were new to the city of Prince George, they'd been there for quite some time already. When you think of Prince George, you probably think of people who are always willing to lend a hand and a more relaxed way of life. Well, that's what attracts many to live on the north end. But people have been living in the heart area of town long before it was part of the city of Prince George. It was very much out in the boonies, but that's just what some residents liked. My mom and dad bought an acre of land on West Austin in 1958. And at that time, this was totally bush. It was like a big, <laughs> big area of big trees or nothing. And it was, West Austin was a dirt road. It was, <laughs> it was all dirt and mud holes and ruts. And, <laughs> and all my dad and mom's friends said that they were silly to come out here because there was no water, no nothing. The remoteness created a strong feeling of community among the people that lived north of the city but it could also be a pain to go into town on the weekly shopping trip. Dad had this old truck that had just one seat, the cab, and we asked girls, there was eight of us, so we had to take turns. <laughs> so every Saturday was a shopping day, and we didn't get to town that often because eight of us took eight weeks. <laughs> Of course, as time went on, there were more services in the heart, and even though it had joined the city, it still had that out-of-town feeling. 
We moved in on November 1st. The snow was about 12 feet deep. The <laughs> it was a cheap house, mm -hmm. a cheap starter home. And so, uh, plus I had had a brother that lived out in the heart and uh, we moved here from Toronto. We were thinking we wanted the green space and all that. So that's why we moved to the heart. The feeling in the heart at that time, it was very much out in the wilderness, actually. It was, we didn't have street lights. Uh, we never had the streets plowed. <laughs> Snow was deeper than anything. The fixtures of the community are very much something Hart residents take pride in. Even today, like the Hart Ski Hill that's been serving the community for 50 years, the Hart Mall that also serves as a community meeting place, and the Hart Community Center. We've volunteered and put in an elevator and we've put new floors and we put new roof and we put new bathrooms upstairs. We a complete total kitchen that revels anything in town. And um, so, you know, there's upkeep and changes. And we have a liquor license and we have a restaurant license and, um, you know, all of that took a lot of people coming together, doing a lot of things to be able to get those. And we're busy all the time. We have preschool, we have anything and everything that's sort of big happens here because we've got the space. Today, there's a lot of development happening on the North End. As the kids and grandkids of Hart homeowners grow up, they're choosing to buy in the Hart instead of moving into town. The people in the heart that grew up in the heart, they want to stay in the heart. It's amazing, you, you get people that are grow up downtown, they want to stay downtown. But the people in the heart, they do the hunting, the fishing, and they're more outdoorsy than other areas of town. Mm -hmm. And so they have lots of toys and they like the country, the country living. It's also the people that hold the heart community together. They're known for being neighborly, and great volunteers. There are all kinds of people living side by side in neighborhoods that aren't quite cookie cutter. I still have the kids that I grew up with when we were grade four, grade five. They're still my best friends. And our wives are best friends. Our kids are best friends. You know, so that's, that's the biggest thing. The people is what keep people here. I've had a number of people that come. The, one of the biggest fallacies is people come to Prince George for two years. And they've been here for 20 years. My wife came here with her parents for two years. That was 1957. And she's still here and she's not going to move. Ask any Hart resident. They'll tell you it's the people that make it so great. Well, the same could be said about College Heights. It's also seen a huge amount of development in a short period of time. Originally, the area of land was covered in forest and was purchased in the mid-50s by Bishop O'Grady from the Catholic Diocese. He purchased that land and developed a good portion of it. He saw the value in northern BC and wanted to improve the Catholic school system in many communities around the region. The church owned it, I should say, and um, it was a, a source of revenue for the diocese because when he became bishop in 56, it was very much a missionary land. It was a vast territory, basically, yeah. and what his vision was, um, it's hard to know. Bishop O'Grady started developing the College Heights area with his company called the Domano Construction Company. Those who knew him say he was a doer. He was even nicknamed the Bulldozer Bishop for his enthusiasm for building the North. But his ultimate vision for College Heights was a large Catholic high school called the Prince George College, which was later renamed O'Grady Catholic High. Prince George College was uh, the center of that. Um, and he realized quite early on uh, that this area, uh, uh, College Heights and Prince George in general, uh, because of the resource industry, uh, was going to grow quite substantially. PG College housed students from around the region in a variety of different dorm buildings. A lot of the development around that area was part of the campus. However, homes did start popping up in the 60s, around the same time that school was complete. At its busiest time, there were about 300 students a school year. 
We had several um, residence buildings, some of which have uh, since been torn down, but the um, the Demano Renewal Center, which is our retreat center, is composed entirely of what used to be student residences. So um, the, the some of those buildings still stand. At the time, it was a reasonably uh, sized school uh, in terms of uh, uh, student body and you know course offerings. The area around the school began developing slowly, first starting in upper and lower college heights with homes popping up in the early 70s and in 1975 it was officially part of the city of Prince George. The majority of college heights residents were some of the only people outside of city limits that were in favor of amalgamation in that referendum. In um well, the early 60s, uh, it would be Upper College Heights, mm -hmm. and in the mid-70s, it started down in Lower College Heights. Um, in the 80s, over by um, St. Lawrence, you know, it moved up from Demano Boulevard up to St. Lawrence. And in the back end here, <coughs> where Southridge is, all those Crescents, uh, St. Anne's, and then up the hill. Yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> but the, <coughs> the church, in the beginning, they developed the land, to my understanding. But at one point, they merely uh, sold the land to um, developers. Um, well, they had a company that did that. That was called Heights Lands, that developed the land, but they were still part of the complex structure of church and, and development. Most of the streets are named after universities. Um, Cambridge, Eat, McGill, and then <clears throat> as we went down into Lower College Heights, we became into the um, saints' names, uh, Simon Fraser. Well, that's not a saint, of course, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the history of Canada, basically. Um, and certainly up in St. Lawrence, there was a lot of St. John's Crescent, St. Anne's, uh, and so on. So it was very much a Catholic influence to let the community know that we were active. College Heights Plaza was built in the late 70s with an overweighty and a few stores in that strip mall. And in the early 2000s, even more opportunity for residents living on the West End as Walmart, Canadian Tire and Home Depot were built on what was once Catholic land. Longtime residents say it's always been a great place to live with a strong community feeling. I guess it's like watching your kids grow up. You don't really notice it. But somebody that hasn't seen them for 20 years, there's a big difference, right? So um, I, I don't really notice any difference except more people. When, when I got involved with, or when the CA started, the Community Association, we had five programs. This year we had 220. So, you know, it's, it's just got way bigger. Around the 70s and 80s, when many homes in College Heights were being built, the people buying them were families trying to lay roots. It's still very much the same today. Well, I, I think it was like, I just moved in down the street, right? So my kids went to Gladstone School. They went to the high school, all within five minutes of walking, right? It was just so convenient and people were friendly. Block parties three times a year, right? Uh, grad sales, the whole block would get together. It was, you, you just, where, where we lived, every family had two or three kids, all eight, nine, seven years old. So it was, yeah, it was a, just a great place to, to f have fun. The West End saw even more developments with the announcement of the University of Northern BC. In 1994, the school opened its doors for the first time and that, once again, changed the way people saw Prince George. The university changed it because we went from basically a pulp mill to another industry and it really solidified places and people coming in into Prince George, moving into Prince George, they, it, people didn't want to come to Prince George. And then when we had the university, now it's a destination. It didn't come without controversy though. In the late 80s, BC's Minister of Education was quoted in the Globe and Mail saying people in the interior didn't care about education past grade 12. They cared about the number of trees they cut down or their day at the mine. That caused an outcry from interior residents who sent about 3,000 angry letters to the ministry. About six months later, the BC government passed the UNBC Act and construction began in 1992. It looked much more sophisticated than anything built in our city before.
Right from the very beginning, we got an architecture of the university that was not concrete blocks and square and rectangular buildings. And so the architecture was a statement. Then to have the Queen come here and speak about the architecture, talk about the matchless setting that was Northern British Columbia and this community and this campus, it was an extraordinary moment of, of validation that not only can we have a university, not only can we offer this to our, our children and our children's children as a way of thinking about how they can live fulfilled lives in Northern British Columbia, but now we get, for the lack of a better word, the royal mark of approval. Yeah, it was a big moment. And the development didn't stop there. Now, even more people are calling University Hill home as more subdivisions are being built with an abundance of high-end luxury homes. the north and west ends that are experiencing growth today, there's been a serious push to get more people living in the downtown. Reinvigorating our downtown has been a major priority for mayor and councils for more than 20 years. As the city grew, more and more people moved outward. While there have been apartment buildings and other multifamily dwellings in the downtown area for decades, the majority of our city's population has chosen to live further away from the business district. In recent years, newer and more modern condos and homes have been popping up, but there are much larger projects still underway. In December of 2017, a significant development was announced, and what better place for it than right next to City Hall. It's a game changer for our downtown and it's a game changer for our city. Uh, I've been here a lot of years and we've continually talked about needing and wanting uh, residential development downtown and here we are tonight. The uh, city has passed uh, the recommendation and we're going to move forward with this and we'll see the ground breaking in sometime in the spring. Construction on that 151 unit project is still underway but it's finally starting to take shape. It's been more than a year of street closures and noise, but mostly excitement from downtown business owners and city staff. You've seen it in a lot of larger city centers where they're challenged to, to retain people after five o'clock, uh, particularly on the weekends when they want to get home or get out of town. Uh, development such as this, where you've now got residential strategically positioned in the downtown to access restaurants, to access um, shops and stores, uh, that will only serve to increase that revenue stream coming into them. And a second high-density housing project was approved earlier this year. That'll be built in the empty space just behind the Prince George Public Library. This time, the focus is on students, another important piece of the puzzle to bring life back into the downtown. In addition to just having housing downtown, that's, his, uh, that's been a, a dream or a goal for almost uh, as old as I am, so uh, several decades. And then in addition to this is the um, opportunity for students to give them um, viable options. And it's just really good news for our city. And um, as you say, the developers were there last night and they're excited to get going. And um, it's just gonna really add to the vibrancy of our downtown to have all those young folks. Roughly 200 more units are expected from that six story development. It's an attempt by the mayor and council of today to put Prince George on the map as a well-rounded city with a vibrant downtown to match its well-established outlying communities with rich histories and residents who love to tell their stories. Year over year, the city has broken records for the amount of building permits issued in nearly all areas of town. And much like 1912 when there was word of a railway or the 1960s when pulp mill talk began, the city of Prince George is in a place that has been quite a few times before, with a hope of big things to come.